Hello, good morning, everybody. I am Dr. Gurunath Badiger, Associate Professor of English, Government Pasha College, Dharwad. Today, in this session, I am going to talk on English literature of 14th, 15th, and 16th century. That is from Chaucer to William Shakespeare. As you all know, 14th century play an important role as we see the beginnings of English literature here. So the session will focus on the important writers of 14th century, 15th century, and 16th century. I'm going to share the slide now for you and we shall discuss some important historical events, important writers, trends, moments of these periods. I'll be highlighting only the important issues related to British literature of this period. You know, every literature is the product of a society the product of a uh, historical you know events and the literature is shaped by the changing social historical conditions so before we begin discussing the history of English literature, it is better to understand what's the history of English language. I'm going to give you a brief idea of uh, history of English language. You know, um, England uh, had seen the real settlements in uh, 5th and 6th century AD and mainly because of the three Germanic tribes whom we call the Jews, Angles and Saxons who laid the foundation of English nation. And the real settlements happened in 5th and 6th century. And we begin to talk about the shaping of uh, Old English in 7th century. And uh, we divide the history of English language into three important stages, what we call the landmarks. And these landmarks are Old English, Middle English, and Modern English. If Old English is uh, extending from 7th century to 11th century, the Middle English uh, now covers the period of 11th to 15th century, and from 16th century onwards, we see the development of modern English. Each period is marked by certain characteristics. Old English, we call it a period of pure English. English was not affected by foreign languages. That's why it is called pure English period. It's also called the period of uh, inflections. Uh, so many inflections were in Old English. And this period is also called Anglo-Saxon period. And we can see four dialects during this time, the Kentish dialects, the Mercian dialect, the Northumbrian dialect, uh, and the West Saxon dialect. Uh, in, in, in this particular period, you can see that uh, there were hardly foreign influences. Uh, and it is called the period of uh, full of inflections. And coming down to Middle Ages, but in Mid Middle English period. Middle English period, we normally begin with the Norman con conquest. In uh, 1066, Norman conquest happened. With this Norman conquest, we see the influence of French on um, English. Uh, French influenced greatly on both grammar, pronunciation, spelling, vocabulary. 
and uh, here you can see the cutting down of inflections here and that's why this period is called the period of leveled inflections and the last stage is modern english modern english is the product of renaissance influence it begins in 16th century modern english is again divided into early modern and later modern if 16th century is called early modern from 17th century onwards we can see later modern influences anyway it is during this period is through the huge influence of greek and latin as you know again the new learning is one of the important aspects of these influences and um, it, this period also witnesses the great vowel shift, fixing of the world order, loss of inflections. These are the characteristics of English language. Finally, there is uh, now uh, a kind of a fixing of world order and pronunciation, the development of dictionaries, the development of pronunciation dictionaries. All that happened in the later stages uh, of modern English. This is a brief overview of history of English language uh, and let's move towards history of English literature. It's only after the rise of a language we can see the rise of literature and normally every country has witnessed the strong oral literature before we see the beginning of uh, a written uh, literature. Uh, similarly, England had witnessed such a strong oral literature uh, in 7th, 8th, 9th and 10th century. And the real beginning of uh, the written literature is said to have been uh, with the publication of Beowulf. Uh, the author of this particular book is not known and Beowulf is said to be the first written literary creation in English. Uh, you know, it's about uh, the great hero of the greats uh, who comes to the aid of Hrothgar, king of Danes, and whose great hall Herod is plagued by monster Grandel. Um, Beowulf tells the story and how Beowulf kills Grandel with his bare hands uh, is an uh, interesting uh, story of uh, this spirit. Later we see the poets like William Langland uh, with his famous book, uh, uh, Pierce the Plowman, uh, it is also called the first provincial work. And the next poet is John Gower, uh, who is known for his uh, you know, work, Confessio Amantis. Gower was a big influence on Chaucer. Chaucer was, um, you know, <laughs> both um, a friend and a rival. Chaucer dedicated his uh, famous poem, Troilus and Cressida, uh, to Gower. That's a very interesting thing we should know. It is also during this period we can see the writers like John Wycliffe, who is known for his earliest uh, translations of uh, uh, tracts and pamphlets uh, in English. And he is said to have uh, you know, translated the Bible, of course. It's not very, very clear. We begin to talk about translations in 16th century by Tyndale and Cowdale. But uh, we need to remember these earliest writers like William Langland, John Gower, John Wycliffe. And it's after this we can see Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, whom we call the first national poet of England. Um, and the, the great poet of 14th century and uh, the man who could present in his uh, poem the picture of England. Uh, that's why Geoffrey Chaucer is very, very important. The first great poet of uh, England. 
And his writing period is in fact uh, divided into three important stages which are named as the French period, Italian period and English period. To this French period, uh, we can see some of the works like Ramon of Rose, the Book of Duchess and the Parliament of Pauls belong. And the second period, Italian period, uh, you know, we see the production of Trialis and Cressid, the House of Fame and the Legend of Good Men. And the last and uh, very important English period, you can see his masterpiece, Canterbury Tales, with a prologue. And normally, whenever we talk about Geoffrey Chaucer, we talk about Canterbury Tales, we talk about the prologue to Canterbury Tales, and his, his, his portrayal of English society of 14th century. Uh, in fact, Canterbury Tales is about some 29 pilgrims. Of course, there is controversy about the number. Uh, 29 pilgrims of both sexes and all ranks uh, taking a pilgrimage to uh, Canterbury, where you have the shrine of uh, St. Thomas Becket. And um, on the way, they meet at Tabard Inn, um, you know, and they decide to tell the stories. And these stories are called tales. And the general prologue uh, to Canterbury Tales is uh, a wonderful uh, portrayal of 14th century England, in which he speaks about uh, various uh, um, uh, types of people in the society. Uh, Chaucer presents uh, the uh, three sections of the society, the ruling class, the priest class, and the peasant class. You know, you have the ruling class represented by knight, squire, you have uh, uh, the uh, the church class represented by parson, priest, nun. You have the common people represented by, you know, the farmers are uh, there. There is a wipe of bath, and and these people uh, represent the common man. And obviously, both men and women are represented here. And that's, that's, that has a social importance. Uh, he recreated the social history of England through the general prologue. So in that way, general prologue is a very important work. And move on to the 15th century. Of course, we need to know certain uh, historical events of medieval England. We talk about Hundred Years War, uh, which is said to have uh, been taken between uh, 1337 to 1453. These Hundred Years' War uh, were fought between England and Fra France, uh, and it is regarded as the longest military conflict in European history. You know, England and France fought for such a long time, you know, for the sake of power. In the meanwhile, we also see the War of Roses. War of Roses um, is a series of English civil wars fought by the dynasties for the control of the throne of England. Uh, it's also a very disastrous uh, civil war. The effect is that uh, many male lines of uh, both the sides you know, were eliminated. And that is the, the result of uh, this War of Roses. Why, why this War of Roses? In fact, it is called War of Roses because the, this is a fight between two houses, the House of Lancaster, represented by Red Rose, and the House of York, represented by White Rose. That's why it is called War of Roses. Move on to 16th century. Yeah, now in 16th century England, um, so many changes happened. 16th century is known for uh, big, big changes in the history of English literature. 
why 16th century is important 16th century there is an effect of renaissance on england although the um, onset of renaissance took place in 15th century but the real effects of renaissance uh, begin to be felt in england in 16th century so uh, renaissance england and elizabeth in england you know go together here so uh, we have to understand the characteristics of uh, renaissance here uh, major characteristics are new learning what is this new learning new learning is the result of uh, a historical event called fall of constantinople in 1453 and the Turks uh, attacked Constantinople and the scholars fled to Italy and Italy um, was the home of Renaissance and, and became the center of new learning and uh, they, they, they uh, you know, spread knowledge, classical knowledge, Greek, Latin, you know, Italy became the center of new learning and all went there and studied classical books and they were in fact um, you know enlightened by the new knowledge that's what we call new learning and this is one of the reasons why in the english literature uh, took a new shape in 16th century there was also another important uh, historical and religious event that is reformation of church Reformation of church, uh, you know, also uh, influenced the literature of secular uh, kind, the secular literature. Uh, the Reformation was the result of translation of the Bible by Tyndale and Coverdale. And at the same time, Henry VIII was excommunicated by the Roman Pope in 1533, and he was angry. And he there was the establishment of Church of England and the publication of Common Book of Prayers. All these uh, events, um, you know, led to the rise of uh, Protestant. And obviously, you know, um, Bible was translated into English and um, the exploitation of the poor people was stopped. And this, uh, and led to uh, a great reformation in England. There is also one more important thing uh, during this period is nationalism. Nationalism is, uh, you know, the product of national sentiment. Um, you know, particularly when Queen Elizabeth became the Queen of England in 1558, and um, they, they in fact respected the Queen very much. They loved their language. They loved England, they loved their queen. That's what we say. They, they lived intensely. And the victory of Spanish Armada in 1588 was another reason for the height of uh, national sentiment. Humanism is another characteristic which is in fact influenced by the study of classical literature. They read the great human stories of Oedipus, Antigone, Electra, you know, Iliad, Odyssey, all wonderful stories of human beings. And obviously, in the humanistic literature and the literature influenced by humanism is, is a scene during this time. Printing machine also played a major role in England because Printing the book, publishing the book was a big issue. And William Caxton brought the printing machine to England. He said to have brought printing machine to England in 1476. And this changed the very, very publication uh, system. And it, it, it gave a lot of uh, um, push to the book publication. And another important aspect is uh, discoveries of new lands and uh, the travel accounts of great voyagers like Huckleth and Drake. And this brought about, again, new knowledge about new lands, new people, you know, climates, 
what you see in the plays of uh, William Shakespeare, The Tempest. Uh, this shows that there was a great influence of uh, these discoveries too. And let's move towards uh, important uh, poets of uh, Elizabethan period. Elizabethan period is known for uh, wonderful production of poetry. Um, in fact, the rich poetry was written during this period. Um, it's called the Great Romantic Period. The first Romanticism is seen in England during 16th century and the second Romanticism you can witness in 19th century. This period is also called uh, the nest of singing birds because more than 200 fires were recorded during this time. In such a small country like England, you can see a number of poets writing poetry. And poetry was all, also influenced by mm, the classical learning. Of course, uh, the influence of Italy is very obvious on uh, uh, poetry. And the, the poetry begins with the publication of Tottel's Miscellany, uh, which is also known as the Songs and Sonnets by Watt and Surrey in 1557. Who is this Tottel? Tottel was a printer and a publisher. And that's why this miscellany is named after him. And uh, our uh, pioneers are Thomas Watt and Earl of Surrey who borrowed a sonnet from Italy. And uh, uh, Petrarch was the pioneer of uh, Italian sonnet and they borrowed the sonnet form. It's a wonderful uh, genre, um, which is written in 14 lines. Now we see sonnet is described as a lyric written in iambic pentameter lines with the rhyme scheme. Two types of sonnets we see. One, the Petrarchan sonnet, the other, Shakespearean sonnet. That followed a uh, Petrarchan model, that is, octave, eight lines, and sestet, six lines. The rhyme scheme is ABBA, ABBA, CDE, CDE. Whereas Surrey developed a new model to suit the English you know, language. Uh, he wrote sonnet with three quatrains and a couplet. A quatrain is a four-line stanza. So three quatrains and a couplet with a rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Uh, it is later known as Shakespearean sonnet because uh, it is Shakespeare who perfected this and who popularized this sonnet form. That's why we call this sonnet not as a Sarayan, but as Shakespearean sonnet, because Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets in this model. Let's talk something about uh, Edmund Spencer. Edmund Spencer, Spencer is called at once the child of Renaissance and Reformation. He is also called uh, the poet's poet. Many poets of England in the later period were very much influenced by um, Edmund Spencer and they are indebted to him because Spencer was the greatest non-dramatic poet of 16th century. His major works, as you know, Fairy Queen, which is an allegory. And in fact, Spencer wanted to write 12 books on 12 virtues but during his lifetime he could complete only six books and the seventh remained incomplete and all for these 12 books he has in fact identified 12 virtues for book one holiness for book two temperance for book three chastity for book four friendship five justice and six uh, courtesy and Spencer is also famous for his uh, pictorial quality. Fairy Queen is a wonderful allegory. He indirectly, in fact, uh, and, uh, referring to the Queen of England, that is Queen Elizabeth, 
and um, through various characters like Gloriana, Una, he in fact uh, describes the great qualities of uh, uh, the queen. And obviously, uh, Spencer is also known for his um, famous stanza uh, called Spencerian stanza. It's a nine line stanza, it is also called Nonet. So uh, he used uh, Spencerian stanza in um, Fairy Queen. He also wrote pastoral poems, a Shepherd's Calendar, modeled on Virgil and Theocritus. Uh, and this uh, poem consists of 12 eclogues. And uh, Spencer was a great sonneteer too, and he wrote 88 sonnets in his famous sonnet sequence, Amorati. Uh, and his sonnets are addressed to his uh, Lau, his wife, Elizabeth Boy. And Spencer wrote two wedding songs, Epithelonian and Prothalamian. Uh, Spencer's influence on uh, English poets like Milton, William Wordsworth, Tennyson is very, very great. And uh, we continue to talk about the uh, Elizabethan poets, Sir Philip Sidney. Philip Sidney is also a very important sonneteer of England, and his famous sonnet sequence is Astrophel and Stella. Uh, unlike Spencer, of course, uh, uh, Sidney's love was a frustrated love, and um, his sonnets deal with his uh, disappointment, frustration, um, in love for uh, Penelope. He wanted to uh, marry Penelope, but Man Penelope married Lord Rich, and his sonnets deal with uh, such uh, disappointment in love. And Sidney was also a, the, a great critic, he is said to have been the first great critic. He introduced the critical ideas of Renaissance theories to England in his famous book, The Defense of Piety. And uh, William Shakespeare, if Spencer is called the greatest non-dramatic poet, William Shakespeare is a dramatic poet. He was a poet, he was a dramatist. You know, he wrote 154 sonnets and two narrative poems. He perfected uh, Surrey's model of sonnet, um, which is now popularly known as Shakespearean sonnet. I have told you that the rhyme scheme of Shakespeare's sonnet is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, Z. And his sonnets are addressed to two persons, WH and Dark Lady. There's a controversy about uh, who is WH, but let's not discuss seriously about this. Uh, some of his sonnets were addressed to WH, his friend, and Dark Lady. His narrative poems are Venus and Adonis and Rape of Lucrece. Uh, both are um, amorous poems dealing with the theme of love. Thomas Sackville is another poet of this period uh, whose mirror for magistrates is known for use of rhyme royal. Rhyme royal is a stanza of seven lines. Chaucer used rhyme royal and Sackville also used rhyme royal. The other poets of this period are Michael Drayton, Thomas Campion and Samuel Daniel. With this, we close the discussion on uh, Elizabethan poetry and move on to Elizabethan drama. And uh, if you uh, discuss uh, how the development of drama took place in England, there are four stages. Earlier plays were uh, uh, on mystery and miracles. Bible was the theme. There were cycles in England and uh, the, the playwrights and actors were moving from one place to another place in the cycles. And they were enacted in villages, towns. And the major theme was uh, mysteries of, um, you know, 
Jesus Christ, Adam, Eve, the story of the Bible and religion. Miracle place, we're also the extension of that and it's about the saints and the miracles they have, you know, played. The next stage of development of drama is morality place. The morality place, the best example is every man. And after that, the place where we begin to appear for the sake of entertainment. Interludes were purely entertainment place. So, uh, this here we can see art for art's sake. Morality, it was art for life's sake. Some kind of a lesson was there. Whereas regular drama appeared in England, it is partly because of the new learning, partly because of influence of Seneca and other Greek playwrights. So, the earliest tragedy we can see in England is Gorbudak, uh, which is also known as Ferex and Forex by Sackville and Norton in 1562. And the earliest comedy is said to be Ralph Royster Dwyster, uh, published in 1551 by Nicholas Udall. So, with this, we move on to uh, another important group of playwrights in England, uh, University Wits. University Wits, you know, when we talk about University Wits, University Wits are the pioneers of English drama. And they are the real men who, in fact, laid a foundation for English drama on which Shakespeare built a beautiful dome. It's a group of young uh, playwrights associated with Oxford and Cambridge universities. Uh, and, um, you know, they were writing plays for the sake of livelihood. And um, Shakespeare borrowed so many things from them. Techniques, you know, style of writing, you know, themes. So in that way, uh, Shakespeare is very much indebted to University bits. These university bits of George Peel, Robert Greene, Thomas Nash, Thomas Lodge, Thomas Kidd, Christopher Marlowe. And Peel is known for his production of The Arraignment of Paris. He was the one to write romantic comedy. Later we see the development of romantic comedy by Shakespeare. Robert Greene was uh, famous for his Prior Bacon, Prior Bungay. Um, he was uh, famous for uh, uh, characterization in comedies. Uh, you know, Robert Greene was the one who called Shakespeare an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers. Uh, and Thomas Lodge was the minor playwright, and uh, he wrote uh, Wounds of Civil War. But his prose romance, Rosalind, helped Shakespeare to write As You Like It. Thomas Kidd is important because he introduced a revenge tragedy. The famous of this kind is the Spanish tragedy written by Thomas Kidd. The greatest among the university wits was um, Christopher Marlowe. You know, his major plays are Edward II, The Jew of Malta, Tamburlaine, The Great, and Dr. Faustus. Uh, in fact, uh, Marlowe was a big influence on uh, Shakespeare. In fact, Shakespeare uh, could write character tragedies modeled on uh, Christopher Marlowe. He was the first to use the blank verse in place. And blank verse is called Marlowe's Mighty Line. And uh, Dr. Faustus is known as Renaissance tragedy. Dr. Faustus sells his soul to devil Mephistopheles and for the sake of knowledge. And um, he's the one who died for the sake of knowledge. This is why we call this uh, tragedy as a tragedy for, uh, for lust of knowledge. So uh, this is how, how the University of Wits um, laid the foundation for English drama. And uh, with this, you know, we see the beginning of uh, the great career of uh, William Shakespeare, the bard of Avon, you know, 
in fact, the greatest dramatist of all times. You know. um, he was the one who could write the great tragedies and the great comedies, the greatest tragedies and greatest comedies. Uh, you know, he did write Hamlet, the story of uh, uh, procrastination, the tragedy of procrastination or delay in taking decision. Othello is a tragedy of uh, suspicion. And, um, you know, Othello was, uh, he was a Moor of Venice. Hamlet was a Prince of Denmark. Macbeth was uh, the King of uh, Scotland. It's a tragedy of our ambition. King Lear, the King of England, uh, who failed to judge his three daughters, you know, um, and obviously, all these uh, tragedies are called character tragedies. And it is because of one mistake or uh, a flaw, what we call tragic flaw, and the, the heroes die here. He did write great comedies like Love's Labour's Lost, A Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, Twelfth Night, The Merchant of Venice, um, all are very interesting uh, plays. Uh, Shakespeare perfected romantic comedies, um, you know, full of songs, pastoral life, you know. And Shakespeare did write some chronicles also, what we call history plays. Richard II, Henry IV, part one, part two, and Henry V. And his last plays are also very, very important um, because you see the maturity in Shakespeare's language and the thought becomes more important in the later part of his life. Cymbeline, The Winter's Tale, and The Tempest is said to be the last play of Shakespeare. Shakespeare is famous for great plots, superb characterization, and um, wonderful heroes he created in tragedies, and charming and intelligent heroines he created in comedies. Shakespeare uh, did understand the national sentiment and uh, he, he, he produced the plays um, needed for 16th century audience. Of course, the Shakespeare's uh, plays are still relevant because they deal with universal truth universal um, matter of understanding. So with this, we close discussion on 16th century drama and move towards Elizabethan prose. Uh, some important writers, whenever we talk about Elizabethan prose, we talk about Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon, the wisest, the greatest, and meanest of mankind, what Alexander Pope writes, <laughs> is the greatest prose writer uh, and essayist of 16th century. His essays are known for aphorism, aphorism, pragmatic thought, impersonal, crisp, and epigrammatic style. So each sentence is uh, full of meaning, we call. So that's what we call epigrammatic style. Each sentence has a quality to become a proverb or a maxim. Uh, he wrote essays, of course, uh, they appeared in three installments and the third edition contains 58 essays. And his famous book is The Advancement of Learning. The other books are The New Atlantis. And he also wrote uh, three great Latin words. One important one is Nom Arganum. And his important essays, to remember, his essays always begin with of, of studies, of revenge, of friendship, of love, of death, of gardens, like this. So uh, Shakespeare, uh, now Francis Bacon set the new trend for writing essays in England. Essay as a genre uh, was strongly you know, developed by uh, Francis Bacon. The other prose writers of this spread are Roger Ascham um, and uh, 
John Lilly, who is famous for his book, UPS, The Anatomy of Wit. His UPS is uh, remarkable for developing euphistic style. Saying hard things in a soft manner is called euphemism. And euphistic style is modeled on uh, John Lilly's UPS. We see Richard Hooker, of, uh, whose book of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. Uh, Robert Burton, a very interesting book, The Anatomy of Melancholy. In fact, in which he discussed species of anatomy, kinds of anatomy, causes for anatomy. Uh, uh, sorry, species, kinds, causes, and cure for melancholy. So, what are the reasons for being melancholic? Is beautifully discussed in Robert Burton and how to cure this melancholy. And we also see the host of uh, translators in 16th century. Translators play a very important role. And Chapman is one of the great translator. He translated Homer. Uh, Keats wrote one wonderful sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer. It's very much influenced by Chapman's Homer. So these, these are the great you know, writers and their works written during these uh, prayers, 14th, 15th, and 16th century. Uh, this is a brief overview. I try to explain some major writers of this particular period. And uh, we need to focus on important lines, themes, techniques. And we also need to understand the uh, plot of major works of uh, Shakespeare, Marlowe, Spencer, Chaucer. So we need to also understand various genres developed during this period. So with this, I'm going to conclude my discussion on the literature of 14th, 15th and 16th century. And thank you very much for patient listening.